Hi everyone, so carrying on with my Ace Lightning Review series, I'm actually going to do something a bit different. I'm actually going to watch the episode as I'm recording and pretty much review of any certain bits that I see and, well, I'll just see if this format, format works. If it doesn't, I'll go back to the old one, but let's see, let's see. Anyway, back to the episode. Um... As the last episode ended with a cliffhanger of Ace getting captured by Lord Fear, um, it's up to Mark to save him. Now, as I mentioned before, the first episode pretty much just established who Mark is. This episode kind of focuses a lot more on the video game characters. So, yeah. So one thing I just want to point out about this episode is we see a lot. We see the inside of Lord Fear's headquarters, the haunted house, and. When there's no human characters, the CGI count the computer generated characters just fit in with the whole scenario. In fact, I love the whole setup of the haunted house. It definitely feels like one of those cheap, rundown type amusement park haunted houses that you see. But considering that Lord Fear is written to be a generic, over-the-top video supervillain, it fits in with his personality. Another thing I just want to point out is whenever Lord Fears... I, I, sorry, um, I do this unscripted in case you couldn't tell, and when I'm off script, oh, I jumbled up my words, but whenever Lord Fear moves, you hear like this I, I don't know how to describe it, creaking or squeaking whenever he moves, it makes sense, he's meant to be a skeleton, and it, it's it's just a really satisfying sound, I know that sounds weird, but it, it just makes you, it's just one of those sounds that make you shiver, but at the same time you bit, it's a bit calmed and it happens every time not only when he extends his limbs it happens every time he moves his fingers as well so yeah i gotta give props to the sound effects team for keeping it all together and keeping it all in line one thing i didn't quite praise too much in the last review is michael riley's performance as ace lightning i mean he just has the perfect superhero voice, if you know what I mean. Whenever he speaks, he's like, oh yeah, I definitely want to hear him. He's, it's the perfect voice for superhero monologues. If, I wouldn't be surprised if, <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if he does like um, conventions where he's just asked to read a comic book line because he's just got the perfect voice for it. And, I mean, I, I don't know, I have not looked up his filmography, but if he's never played Batman, I'd be really surprised, because he's got the perfect Batman voice. Again, I've got to give praise to the music. It's <laughs> it's just so catchy. It, for this one in particular, when Mark's dad is on a massive lawn mower, he, it's this heavy metal rock that... Pretty much shows what's happening on the screen, and you know it's just enough to, for you to you know get the adrenaline pump in and move your head up and down like you're at a concert. One thing, another thing I didn't point out is Mark's parents. Um, they don't really get too heavily involved in the series, unfortunately. I don't know if that would have changed in the cancel season three, but for the first two series, they're just written as Mark's parents, like, there's no, um, they're kind of just there, if you know what I mean, they're, they're just there, and they're, they're not bad, it's just, they don't really serve too much of a purpose, and it's a bit unfortunate, because I think there could have been episodes where they could have focused more on Mark and his relationship with his parents, but then again, maybe there is an episode I can't really remember. We'll see what happens as the series goes on. At one point in the episode, Mark has a manual. In fact, he uses this manual a majority of season one, which is meant to be for the game. And 
occasionally the camera will cut to whatever he's reading in whatever he's reading and it occasionally shows these illustrations of all the characters and I just think they are just very well detailed and they show a few more they show a few more parts of the character that's not actually shown in the show I don't know if that was cut for budget reasons but yeah I just got to praise the got to praise the effort that they put in the props considering that the Ace Lightning series doesn't exist in real world standards I mean it does but the actual franchise within the show doesn't exist in the real world but it I, I've just it's one of those little things even though this show wasn't is not that well known and is pretty obscure it does I, I just gotta praise all the little details and efforts it really just goes to show no matter what film production you're involved in you know people put a lot of passion and dedication to make this world feel more alive I do like the little detail of Mark bringing his controller with him to the haunted house to try and save Ace it's like he's trying to use gamer logic to defeat the characters like maybe he's thinking if this is used to defeat them in the game maybe it can use to to defeat them in the real world but it's pretty obvious that the rules have changed but I like how he at least tries he tries this idea out showing that he is pretty creative with the ways he wants to beat the bad guys really Another thing I want to point out about this episode is this is when I don't know if it's a bit too quick, but Samantha is getting suspicious of Mark, and from the way Mark explains it, I wouldn't blame her for being like concerned because all he says like he says stuff like I got this friend who's in trouble, and he won't reveal anything else, and you got to remember, this is set in America, so, God, this, you, you can understand why she gets so invested in what, what he's doing. And plus, since he always goes back to the carnival, which, as, it, as if you watch the episode, and as you can tell by the look of it, it's not a, it doesn't look like a safe place to be in, and it seems rather dodgy, so... Yeah, you can understand her whole character with her relationship with Mark. So this is also one of the f- one of the few episodes that uses practical effects for the characters. Um, for this instance, it's for Dirty Rat, who is used to disguise himself as a bunny, and it's clearly meant to be a puppet, but. It is it is nice that they use practical effects from time to time. And I think it's very effective. It definitely in fact, to tell the truth, it pretty much makes it more creepy. So yeah. And that was episode two. So really what I should have done is watch this one and episode one back to back because that's pretty much the whole point. Um yeah, I've pretty much talked about all the main stuff I wanted to discuss. Um, I'm not sure about this format. I'll go to that in a minute. One thing about this episode I just want to point out is the ending on how Samantha thinks Mark's a bit of a weirdo. And the end of the episode kind of implies that their relationship is going to be awkward. But it doesn't really... It doesn't really turn out that way it's kind of all forgotten and forgiven by the next episode you know you know status quo rules and all that but um yeah I kind of wish that there are certain elements where I kind of wish they um kept to just to feel more feel less episodic and more continuity continuous uh, yeah, 
I'm not sure about this format I'm using. I think I might have to watch three episodes a day because if I watch one episode individually, I just I, I'm going to run out of things to talk about before the episode's even over because, as I said, most of these episodes do feel like a repeat. They they do feel a bit repetitive, so. Yeah, that was it for this episode. Next week, I might have something different. So, next week, I mean, oh, I don't know, next next time. So, yeah. <laughs>